Today's scripture is Micah 6, 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have... I done to you. In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent you before Moses, sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now that what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam son of Beor answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal. What you may know, the saving, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love with kindness, to walk humbly with your God. It's impossible to do Christianity without being able to hold the hand of your neighbor who is lonely. Our faith calls us into community, and it's one that happens in real time. Our faith points to a God that literally happens in real time. God's love isn't in the clouds. God's saving grace is not in some other dimension. It's not just spirit. It actually takes on flesh and in compassion and solidarity for the human experience becomes one with us. It, it, uh, it is one that happens in real time. Our God happens in real time. That's what we see in Christ, and that's what we see as we practice, as we try to walk with that God. It's in sharing that we come to understand God's presence. And so I'm hammering home Christian community as happening in real time, like this, sitting in a circle with each other. And we're a circle where we strive to love kindness and allow kindness to flourish. I can think of few institutions or organizations in our society that exist for the sole purpose of growing more deeply in love. Like, what other organizations say, I show up every, every week at this time and place to try to be my best, most kind, most loving self to people I, do, I might not even know. And I'm going there to grow in that spirit, to grow in that kindness, to, to go to be in community with the intention of allowing virtues like kindness to flourish. I can think of few organizations like that that exist for a sole purpose like that. Now, some of you might be saying, well, I don't know, Brendan. Church people can be a little bit salty. I'm from New England. We have a re us New England church people, we have a reputation of being a little bit salty, a little bit rough around the gills like that. And to that, I always say, don't look at the New England Congregationalist and say, well, they're sure, you know, our faith says to be kind, but they're a, they're a grouch. Just imagine how much more grouchy they would be if they never had Jesus at all. That's, 
that's actually a, a Sufi expression. It says, don't look to the person who's on a spiritual path and don't, don't look at their bad behavior or their, their uh, sort of more shadowy aspects and, and focus on that. Just imagine how much worse they would be if they had no faith or spirituality or God at all. And so if we're here this morning, it means we're in the effort. We're putting our best foot forward. We're saying, by golly, with the Spirit, a great, it's possible for me to be more kind. It's possible for me to be more loving. It's possible for me to actually walk with God, who is the eternal wellspring of, of, of those virtues, those virtues that we see embodied in, in the way of Jesus. And so for us Christians, we're following a practice that calls us to love kindness, that calls us to indeed walk toward kindness and allow it to flourish in everything that we do. And in the scripture we heard, and, and, we, and we learn in community that it is in community that we get to see it flourish in real time. Uh, it's face to face that we actually learn to practice kindness that we learn to really understand each other. And it's only face to face where we can really embody kindness with each other. Well, it's not the only way, but it really is where we get to see kindness flourish most deeply. And it's in the scripture we heard this morning, uh, the prophet Micah encouraged us to strive towards kindness in this way. We're spending, uh, and so, I say all this about real time uh, and kindness happening in real time because coming out of a year of strict quarantine, I notice I find myself having conversations with friends, family, people in the community about what it was like to just be stuck behind a screen most of the time for the past year. And I want, us, I want to encourage all of us to be kind with ourselves as we reacclimate and readjust to uh, real time. Because we've all just been through something very intense. So be kind with yourselves and be kind with each other. And I feel like there were gains, there were things we learned about the benefits and the positives of social media. Hi, friends on the internet, for example, right there. And, uh, and you are all no less with us, everyone who's, who's joining today. And I also want to say how I think that we've also had an opportunity this past year to learn how social media can be a tool, either used as a tool by us, or it can be something, it can be a tool that turns us into a tool. <laughs> it, it's a tool that we can use for our own benefit and our collective benefit, or it can be something that then uses us, that possesses us. After a year when we were forced, perhaps, to be glued to our screens, we were, before the pandemic, even more than we were before the pandemic, I think we've had an intensive crash course in how social media can serve as a, motor, a motivator for action. We've definitely seen how social media has been a motivator for action. Uh, or it can isolate us in a dimension of overwhelming loneliness, division, disconnection, assumption. These are the risks. In the latter context, I think, we, I think we sometimes see the concept of doing justice, for instance, reduced to the action of saying or posting the most right and righteous sounding thing on social, social media, knowing the right language. I know that I fall prey to that when I'm strictly relegated to, to social media. It becomes so easy to forget kindness when we're only looking at a screen, when we're only looking at the articles that reinforce what we agree or disagree with, and not the people behind the posts. It becomes so easy to forget kindness 
in all of in that world when we're relegated strictly to that world and how doing justice and loving kindness reinforce each other in real time only they happen together again we say we 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 heard, we've heard the quote, I believe it's Cornel West, who said, justice is what love looks like in public. And our faith encourages us to allow kindness to be our motivator for justice, not our desire to sound right and righteous and be right and, and come out sounding right. But kindness, kindness is what motivates our actions to do the actions to ensure equitability and fairness and 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 justice and good relationship right relationship kindness towards ourselves kindness towards our neighbor and the interesting thing is kindness is of god the desire to sound right and win an argument that's our ego but kindness is of god and also and christ points to our potential to, for kindness. Christ is a part of every one of us, and so we have within us that potential for overwhelming kindness. And I want to acknowledge how doing justice absolutely requires taking stances. I think sometimes when we are str striving for kindness, sometimes we sacrifice justice. <laughs> and so justice does require taking stances it, it does require speaking out it does require taking important actions even if that disappoints pe some people some of the time but when in our when in our work for justice we begin dividing and subtracting community dividing and subtracting people rather than adding and multiplying in the work of expanding our humanity and building beloved community, it might mean that we have forgotten to love kindness in our work for justice. When we're dividing and subtracting instead of adding and multiplying community, it might mean we've forgotten kindness. And so the prophet reminds us to do justice, but love kindness in the process. So it's in real time that we see each other's facial expression, hear each other's tone of voice, learn each other's body language and sense of humor. All of that happens in real time and is missed when we're, when we're only on the screen. It's in real time that we can practice and love kindness and allow kindness to flourish and guide our justice work together. Our faith invites us to allow justice and kindness to inform each other, similar to how the Buddhists, in the Buddhist tradition, they talk about how wisdom and compassion are the two wings of a bird, and the bird doesn't fly if wisdom and compassion aren't both flapping together. I think in the same, in the same way the Buddhists have that wisdom, our prophetic tradition invites us to see how we must always must take stances and speak out and take action for what is just and equitable, while also allowing all of our actions and all of our efforts to do justice, to be held in the warmth of kindness, of loving kindness. And kindness is the, I think the impulse that gives each other the benefit of the doubt, that we're all trying, that we all want to be good, that we all want what is best for our neighbor. At least there's a part in every one of us that wants what is best for our neighbor. And kindness is always speaking to that part of the other person and is opening the heart to allow that to be drawn out within us. I wanna tell on myself, uh, us clergy, I think clergy, or as a clergy person, we can congeal into an institutional mindset. And I love the United Church of Christ. I think we do a better job at justice than many, many Christian denominations. I think that our speaking out, for instance, for, you know, seeing all gender expressions of being expressive of the image of God, seeing all, um, speaking out for racial justice as an expression of our faith. 
justice for the poor. I think that you, there are many ways. I think we as the United Church of Christ our, are speaking out for the justice which is at the very heart of the gospel. And I think the United Church of Christ did, does a better job at that. If I didn't think that, I wouldn't have gotten ordained uh, within the United Church of Christ. And so the, the shadow side of that is, you know, I have uh, assumptions about what people from other churches think. And I remember uh, a woman came to me and wanted to get involved, uh, wanted to learn about the church, and uh, I sat down and met with her, and she became very wide-eyed and, and said to me, you're not what I expected and, uh, in a minister. And I said, oh, well, I, I don't know what you expected, but nice to, nice to meet you. And she said, well, I'm looking at your church. It's just all very different. Hi, Emberly. How's it going? Good. Oh, great, because we have an explorer. So we were discussing, and this person was looking at our uh, brochure saw our radical welcome, saw some of our language. It was different from what this person was used to. And this person said, well, I'm looking for, I thought you were a church of Christ. And I said, oh, I, well, we, we are a church of Christ, but our denomination is the United Church of Christ, which is, the piano. you're going to play the piano? <laughs> So she of this person went on to start explaining to me the reasons why uh, we were all damned and going to go to hell for a laundry list of reasons. <laughs> and uh, and you know in that moment uh, I thought okay well where is kindness. <laughs> And, uh, but the interesting thing said, can you give me reasons for, for why you uh, believe what you believe? And then we had a conversation about the Bible and interpretation, and uh, we had a rich and wonderful conversation about biblical scholarship and, and theology. And, all of that is another sermon. I've preached sermons about those things. But what was amazing about the interaction to me is at the end, I had the assumption, okay, well, this person is just going to uh, be mean and angry and hateful. And they said, you know, I've never in my life heard a perspective like that. And that's really interesting. And that really changes my, my life in a big way. And uh, news, the news that you're sharing with me would change the lives of some of my family. And so I could see in a social media realm, I would think, well, that person is over in that camp, and I'm over here, and there's, there's no possibility for for there to be meeting, for there to be transformation, to be for there to be kindness. And at the end of the interaction, the person said, well, you know, I'm going to st stick to where I've been. I'm going to stick to my tradition. But it's been so delightful getting to know you and having a meal together. And I really learned something today. And I was able to say, me too. And that is the grace of kindness, the sort of kindness that happens in real time, that's reinforced by real time kindness. And so kindness facilitates the expansion of true and lasting transformative justice as well. Our ability to understand, our ability to uh, 
treat each other more fa fairly, to treat each other more like human beings. The activist and writer and author Adrienne Marie Brown talks about the work, the difficult work of transformative justice. And that work is hard, coming to the table. You don't, you know, every time we come to that table, we don't know who we're coming to the table with. And we arrive there with this radical claim that everyone around the table is a relative and a part of God's body. And it's a motley crew around that table. And it's a messy process trying to actually br live out a greater love and kindness for each other. Uh, and, Adrian Mar and so really I think that that work is what Adrian Marie Brown calls transformative justice, fostered by the kindness that happens in real time. She writes, real time is slower, much much slower than social media time where everything feels so urgent and immediate. Real time often includes periods of silence, reflection, growth, space, self-forgiveness, processing with loved ones and the other person, rest, responsibility, accountability, the work of transformative justice that happens in real time, she says, is not about pack hunting an external enemy, but the deep shifts that occur in our way of being. It's in real time, she says, that we learn together how to set and hold boundaries, communicate without manipulation, give and receive consent, ask for help, love our shadows without letting them rule our relationships. It's in real time we remember that we are of earth, miracle, and a greater whole, a massive river. These are Adrienne Marie Brown's words, and her words express, uh, for me, the work of loving kindness alongside our efforts to do justice, and how it's only in real time that we can love that river of life that she speaks of, that we can be that river of life that she speaks of together, and see that greater life face to face. It's in real time that we love kindness and welcome its transformative power and its flourishing together. So the prophets tell us we must always do justice, but never stop loving that kindness, yearning for kindness, yearning to be and show kindness and speak to the presence and the potential to be kind in each other. And so now that we're back together in real time, Let's be that place where this whole community can come and do that. Let this place be an epicenter of loving kindness in this community as we walk humbly with God. But more on that next week. Amen. <laughs>